Hey, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Division of Archaeology's virtual lecture series. My name is Megan Clock, and I'm with the department's Office of External Affairs. We've been hosting these research webinars for the last several months, and we're pleased that you could join us for our August installment. Each third Thursday from tonight through October, so just a few months left, or a couple months left at that, you can join us at 6 p.m. Central Time for a new lecture. We're excited to share this series with you as an opportunity to learn about new archaeological research happening here in Tennessee. For those who have joined us in previous lectures, you can probably anticipate the next thing I'm going to share, just some minor housekeeping. We're using the platform WebEx to conduct this evening's presentation. The image on the slide depicts some of the options that are available on WebEx. This should be displayed in the lower center of your screen. Everyone was muted upon entry. Please be sure that your microphone remains on mute throughout the presentation. Additionally, please keep your videos off to prevent any bandwidth issues. Your microphone and your video are off when there's a slash mark across both of the icons. Another icon I'd like to note this evening is the chat icon. It looks like a call out bubble. We'll be using that to submit questions when it comes to the Q&A session of our presentation. Once the presentation is complete, we'll have the opportunity for questions. You can ask a present, uh, excuse me, you can ask a question during the presentation, um, but we ask that you remain on mute and we will answer any questions at the conclusion of the presentation. So please use that chat box to ask any questions tonight. The only time we'll be calling on individuals to speak is to provide an opportunity for any call-in users. If you've called into the meeting tonight, we'll allow you to unmute during the question session. But just to reiterate, if you're not a call-in user, please just use the chat box to ask questions. You can use the chat box to ask questions during the presentation, but we'll wait to answer them at the conclusion. Alrighty. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna to get to the exciting part of the presentation. I'm gonna pass things over to our state archeologist, Phil Hodge, to introduce tonight's speaker. All right, Phil? Thanks, Megan. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth installment in our third Thursday virtual lecture series. We established this series as a way for archaeologists working in the state to share their research um, after having to cancel our traditional in person conference for two years in a row. We also hope this series serves to build momentum toward resuming our regular in person conference in January of 2023. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I always like to thank everyone who make these lectures possible. Um, I'll start with Megan Plot from TDEX Office of External Affairs. Megan handles all of the technical details, manages meeting links, and serves as our event host. And she'll also moderate the Q&A later in the presentation. Also want to thank Mike Morrow with TDEX Office of Communications, as well as Aaron Dieterwolf and Macy Orand within the Division of Archaeology. Aaron and Macy work with Megan and Mike to organize and publicize each event and to also coordinate with our great speakers. It's my pleasure to now introduce our speaker tonight, Ms. Lauren Walls. Ms. Walls is an archaeologist with New South Associates, which is a woman-owned full services cultural resources firm based in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Ms. Walls is a manager of New South's Tennessee branch office, which is here in Nashville. She has directed numerous archaeological survey and excavation projects and conducted National Register of Historic Places evaluations for a variety of federal, state, and local governments, private sector clients, and individuals. Ms. Walls earned her Master of Arts in Anthropology from the University of West Florida. She is a registered professional archaeologist with expertise in historic period and pre-contact sites and specializes in the analysis of faunal and flora remains from pre-contact archaeological sites. Ms. Walls will be the lead presenter tonight uh, for this presentation, but there are two other co-authors who also want to recognize Mr. Danny Gregory and Ms. Velma Fan, both of whom are also with New South and co-authored the report on the Crabtree Farmstead with Ms. Walls. You can visit New South's website to learn more about Mr. Gregory and Ms. Fan and their professional biographies. 
I'm especially excited about Lauren's talk tonight. Um, for those of you who might not know, before I became the state archaeologist, I managed TDOT's archaeology office, and the Crabtree Project was discovered on a TDOT project. Um, that project was just getting underway when I transferred to the Division of Archaeology. Um, at that time, we'd only recently realized um, what the Crabtree Farmstead uh, was and its historic significance and importance. So I'm really excited to see how this project turned out um, over the last two years. So before I hand the virtual floor off to Lauren, let me once again remind everyone uh, viewing tonight to keep your audio muted and your video off throughout the talk. This helps to preserve bandwidth and prevent distractions during the presentation. So. With that, uh, Lauren, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for sharing this pro project with us. Um, I will mute myself and turn the virtual floor over to you. So feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Hi, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so glad to have such an audience uh, this evening, and I hope everyone's had a lovely summer. Um, so, uh, as Phil said, I'm an archaeologist with New South, and uh, this presentation is to tell you about a really interesting project that we did uh, in 2020 and 2021. So, the Crabtree site uh, is a multi generational African American farmstead in Middle Tennessee that we identified, uh, as Phil mentioned, during a survey uh, for TDOT constructing a bypass around Portland. Our understanding of the site that I'm gonna to describe tonight is a result of an evolving multidisciplinary approach where our traditional survey methods were expanded to provide a more comprehensive historic context for the site. The goal of my presentation is to highlight the utility of comprehensive context and how it affected our, our interpretations and how it can benefit sites like it. <clears throat> so following our traditional phase one survey methods, pedestrian survey and shovel testing primarily, the site didn't look like a complex at all. Um, rather, it looked like a group of historic residences and farms in close proximity to a historic cemetery that may or may not have been associated. Our view of the site changed after we were approached by Chastity Crabtree, a young woman living in the modern house on the property. And uh, as an aside, the story of how she scared me in a cemetery at 7 a.m. in the morning is quite funny. <laughs> she told us that these farms and residences represent the history of her family. Her father grew up in one, her grandmother in another, Earlier generations of her ancestors occupied other sections of the site. The story passed down to her was that this property had been in her family since the mid 19th century, occupied by successive generations from emancipation to the present. Our approach to this site went beyond the normal overlap between history and archaeology. Following a tour of the site with TDOT and members of the Crabtree family, we expanded the original survey effort. TDOT and our client, Kim Lee Horn, were very cooperative and worked with us to conduct the additional research needed to really understand the site. So we expanded the phase one, and so what happens in, many times in Tennessee to a quasi phase two, <laughs> or a phase 1A, an evaluation. On the archeology span side, we supplemented the field work with GPR surveys of the cemetery and farmsteads, intensive metal detection, vegetation clearing, sample collections from the historic dumps, and test unit excavation. On the history side, we conducted oral interviews of the Crabtree family members and expanded our traditional archival research to focus on the site and the history of the region surrounding it. New South historian Velma Fan, my co-author, um, and myself, both interviewed three members of the Crabtree family. Chastity Crabtree, her father Clarence, and her uncle Matthew. The genealogies of the families at this site include seven generations, and this doesn't include everyone we've identified. Little is known about the earlier 19th century generations aside from their names at this point, but given the time scale, William Barnes, 
was likely enslaved on the lands of Thomas Bunton. He was the founder of the town of Portland. Chastity's great grandmother, Amanda West, married Arthur Bunton in 1910 and had four children. In 1923, Amanda West Bunton married Samuel Barnes, the great grandson of William Barnes. Amanda's daughter, Priscilla Bunton, married J.T. Crabtree and had two children, Matthew and Clarence, Chastity's father. <clears throat> the archaeological resources at the Crabtree site were divvied up into four loci. After the initial survey using traditional methods, we viewed these loci as separate sites. There was nothing archeological connecting them with the possible exception of an abandoned road that could have just been a driveway for the Locust Three Farm. Once we incorporated the information from the family members and the archival research, our interpretations changed. We saw the site as a single complex occupied by several generations of intermarried families. Locust One at the South End contains the mid 20th century home, that's feature six, an associated chicken coop, which is feature seven, and an older late 19th or early 20th century residence, which is feature 14. And it also contains the modern residence of Chastity Crabtree. Feature six is the home of J.T. Crabtree and Priscilla Bunton Crabtree, Chastity's grandparents. Chastity's father grew up in this house. You can see in the image on the left side of the screen of the Feature 14 residence that extensive vegetation clearing was necessary to identify the footprint of the home here. And there were very interesting and unique artifacts found uh, through our metal detector survey of this area, some of which will be shown later. <clears throat> Locust 2 contains a stock pond feature eight, and outbuildings, features one and two, all dating to the mid 20th century. It also contains a historic cemetery with 22 interments from the Barnes, Crabtree, Bell, Smith, and Dye families. In our oral interviews, Matthew Crabtree told a great story about how the land looked almost like a golf course when they had all the goats there. <laughs> and that Chastity mentioned that her father used to take her on motorcycle rides all over the terrain out here. Locust Three contains the early 20th century residence of Samuel Barnes and Amanda Bunton. Barnes, Amanda Bunton Barnes, excuse me, Chastity's great grandparents. Uh, Locust 3, obviously the most dense, uh, contains 11 historic features, including a house foundation with a limestone walkway, as you can see in the bottom left corner, associated features such as a garage, a well, a stock pond, an animal pen, and at least one outbuilding of unknown function. And as an aside, you know, uh, to find a walkway like this was one of the most exciting and spectacular things uh, beneath uh, the vegetation and the leaf litter. As you can see, it was only a few centimeters beneath, but it was truly, it just kept going. It was amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> Locust 4 is uh, the, to the, to the northeast, uh, northwest rather, the as you would furthest away, uh, it contains uh, two refuse dumps related to the mid 20th century occupations. And I know it just looks like trash in the woods, but I tell you there were some really amazing things in there. So we did sample collections in that location. Okay, <clears throat> so combining the archeological results with the geophysical data, archival research and oral history, we produced a site specific occupational history for this complex. Based on the assemblage, the earliest residence or farm within the complex is feature 14 within Locust 1. None of the Crabtree family remember this house, which was found in thick woods. They remember being filled with goats. That was the first one I pointed out. 
This house likely dates to the 19th century and existing information suggests it was occupied by members of the Barnes family, possibly Chastity's great grandparents, John and Rhody Barnes. The next oldest farm is in Locust 3, the home of Amanda West Bunton Barnes, Chastity's great grandmother. This farm may date to as early as 1877 when the Barnes family owned the property. Amanda lived there after her marriage to Samuel Barnes in 1923. This farm was destroyed by fire in the 1960s. Amanda's daughter, Priscilla, grew up in the house in Locust 3 and occupied the mid 20th century house in Locust 1 as an adult with her husband, J.T. Crabtree, and their two sons. Locust 2 also contains the Barnes Cemetery. In addition to known relatives, the Crabtree family believed that enslaved and indigenous persons were also buried here. As a result of our survey, we found many unmarked burials and had, uh, field stones just covered in leaf litter and vines. So great success, thanks to Chastity. Okay, um, according to the Crabtrees, this farmstead complex has been in the family since emancipation. They noted that 12 former enslaved persons received 40 acres each from the Bunton family. They indicated that the property was passed down through the matrilineal line, beginning with Amanda Barnes. They believe that Amanda was once enslaved on the Bunton property. However, given that Amanda was born sometime around 1894, and that doesn't seem likely. The family lore may have actually been referring to an earlier individual, possibly Amanda Bunton, who was born in 1841. She was the mother of Amanda, she was the mother of Amanda West Bunton's first husband, Arthur, and Chastity's great, great grandmother. The family believed that Amanda West Bunton inherited the land from her first husband, Arthur Bunton. However, deed records show that she purchased the land in 1912 while married to Arthur. Amanda did inherit land within the site from her second husband, Samuel Barnes. The Barnes family had owned the land since at least 1877 and possibly earlier that we haven't been able to confirm that yet. The land containing the site was then passed to Priscilla and JT Crabtree and then to Clarence Crabtree who still owns it to the same. Chastity also currently owns the portion of the property containing her house. So, our research allowed us to evaluate the Crabtree site within a comprehensive historic context that included regional, local, and even site-specific themes. The early history of this site is tied to the plantations of Thomas Bunton and his older brother, John Bunton. Many African-American families in the area, including the Crabtree, Barnes, and Bunton families, are believed to be descended from the enslaved individuals, individuals living on Thomas and John Bunton's former lands. Thomas Bunton, being an ardent secessionist, attracted the attention of Union soldiers during the Civil War. His lands were seized by Union soldiers who confiscated food, burned fences and structures, and encouraged the enslaved population to flee, forcing them to find food and shelter elsewhere. Enslaved families settled throughout the region and several families established a community on John Bunton's former lands west of the Crabtree site on State Route 52. A traveler noted how far apart the houses were and called the area Scattersville, a name the community adopted. Scattersville built its own institutions, including the New Hope Baptist Church, a school, lodges, and grocery stores. It even had a baseball team and a 15-member band. The Crabtree family had strong ties to Scattersville and the New Hope Baptist Church. J.T. Crabtree was a deacon at the church. His son, Matthew, managed the finances of the church for several years. On the agricultural side, the area around Portland is particularly known for its strawberry crops. 
as I'm sure most Tennesseans know. <laughs> the first of these crops were cultivated by African American families, including the crab trees. So despite all of our research, there are still many unknowns in the history of this property. We have not identified a complete chain of occupation from emancipation to the present. The survey results painted what seemed like a fairly clear picture of the site and its 20th century history. Our discussions with the Crabtree family members painted a very different and much more compelling picture. To Clarence Crabtree, this property is integral to his family and its identity. He described vast fields of strawberries and tobacco, how the soil there was perfect for them. He described a place where every nearby farm was worked by his relatives, the Bunton, Barnes, Bell, and Crabtree families. He described his grandmother, Amanda Barnes, looking after her husband and children as they worked the fields. Travelers were hired on to pick strawberries and were fed the food prepared by Amanda and her daughters. Those fields are now filled with soybeans, worked by outsiders driven from large machines. Chastity Crabtree wants to restore her family's farm, to plant strawberries and make the land sustainable again, to honor her family's farming history. To them, this site, is their family's legacy. <clears throat> we all know that field work and archival research can each only give us a piece of the story for a site like this. People's memories of the site and its residents can give us another piece. It can be difficult to merge these perspectives, which can both be complementary and contradictory. Memory is often flawed and our interpretations of the field data are typically based on overlapping assumptions. For Crabtree, we made a concerted effort to utilize all of these sources of information. We walked the site with family members, showing them the features and artifacts and collecting what they remembered about how these places, about these places and the people who lived in them. We used their recollections of the property to guide our investigations and interpretations. Their recollections, recollections not only helped us focus our clearing and excavation efforts, but also made the site more real and more interesting. New tools and technology are so often the markers of progress in archeology. span New tools can be useful, but we should be careful not to forget traditional methods. New tools are sometimes not the best way to understand a site, especially when used in isolation. Obviously, this exact approach doesn't work on all sites. We're lucky in connecting with the Crabtree family, lucky for their interest in the site's history and for their willingness to share it with us. But I suspect informant memories are more commonly available than we tend to assume, especially for 20th century sites. Seeking out these sources should be standard practice for interpreting similar sites. Our work on the Crabtree site demonstrates how a multidisciplinary approach can be tailored to the resource and can provide a much more comprehensive context, a more complete understanding of what the site really is. So I'm going to mention a story my coworker, co-author co and coworker <laughs> relayed to me. Uh, he was asked to apply these lessons to a site from a North Carolina transportation project. We'll keep this vague to avoid criticizing or second guessing another researcher, but they sent him a data recovery report for a historic house site similar in age to the Crabtree site and also occupied by an African American family. The excavation focused on a 20th century house and there were family members that remembered the house prior to its destruction. The family visited the site and provided a lot of information on its history. However, with many, as with many projects, the data recovery work focused solely on the archaeology. Informant memory came too late after the data recovery plan was written and being executed. 
This led to an interpretation of the site and its features that was incomplete and possibly even inaccurate. More importantly, the report resulting from that work does not incorporate the family's perspective. Instead, it reads like a clinical inventory of historic features and artifacts. Following the completion of the project, that report is the only record of the now destroyed house site, the only record of a family's history and their place in the history of the region. We endeavor to place sites in their proper context, but for recent historic sites, I think we can do much better. Like myself, most of you have likely written countless National Register recommendations. Archaeologists naturally tend to focus on physical integrity. But when it comes to historic significance, I think we frequently fall short of the original goal of the National Register, which was to evaluate a site's significance within its proper context. Historic contexts are usually generalized at a regional scale with similar things being similar things being used throughout the Southeast. But is that really the best way to assess significance of a site like Crabtree or similar 20th century sites? The Crabtree site did have a role in the regional history with its ties to the local agricultural economy, emancipation, and reconstruction. And that's about as close to the site as most historic contexts would get. But when we asked Chastity and Clarence Crabtree what they thought about the site, they didn't use those themes or those words. To them, the significance of the site is much more local. It's about Portland and it's about Scattersville. It's about the Bunton Plantation. It's about Mandy Barnes and Priscilla Crabtree. It's about strawberries and tobacco and traveling workers. That facet of the site's context is just as important as any generalized regional theme. And at least to me and my coworkers, it's much more interesting. <clears throat> I want to highlight one last benefit of producing a more comprehensive context, and this is one that we didn't expect. <laughs> Mitigation will likely occur at the Crabtree site. Because of what we learned about the site, we have so many more options for mitigation beyond data recovery excavation. Some degree of data recovery excavation will likely be conducted, and there are plenty of gaps in the site's history that may be filled but public outreach will hopefully play a major role in the mitigation. In addition to educational materials for local schools and the public, we've also proposed doing community events. For example, we thought of hosting a barbecue at the New Hope Baptist Church, having historians and archeologists talk to local residents and share what we've learned. And perhaps more importantly, through those conversations, we could collect their memories of the Crabtree property the family and the community. Obviously, producing a comprehensive historic context is not a new idea, and this presentation is not meant to be a condemnation of past work. The Crabtree site is instead presented as an example of the benefits of producing a comprehensive context and how that context allowed us to preserve a richer and more accurate story of this site and the people who live there. Thanks to TDOA, um, Phil and Aaron, um, for allowing me to share our experience with this. And uh, I guess I'm gonna hand it over for questions. Thanks, Lauren. It's a great presentation, a great project, and a really powerful story um, that comes through in the complementary approach that New South and TDOT took to understand and learn about the Crabtree family and their farm um, in the context of Scattersville and Portland. Um, one question I had maybe to start off the Q&A and, and Megan's going to check the chat box to see what other questions um, our viewing audience has, but uh, I'm glad you brought up the idea of in our significance and what it means to archaeologists and what it means um, to locals. Uh, I know that's one critique that people like Tom Keene, for example, have pointed out about the in our significance criteria and, and what it means to different constituents. So I, I think that's a good point to make. 
Um, you mentioned the application of these methods on a North Carolina project. Do you see a, a, a methodological paper coming out of this project where you could sort of formalize this complementary approach that could be picked up and applied to other sites in Tennessee or across the Southeast to tell these richer, more complex stories um, than just standalone archeological projects? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Phil. I think that, um, I think the key element here was obviously it was chastity and it was a young person who felt strongly about her family's legacy and their land and you know outside of the of the threat of a project seeing that passion come through it gave us great hope that if we do a little more due diligence ahead of time to communicate with landowners and and hear their stories that we can we can really tailor projects to to give us a better a better understanding because it truly it's one of those things where you do a phase one survey and it's just you know footers and a scatter of bricks and then you move on and like in this situation it turned out to be so so much more excellent it's great stuff um, so Megan do we have any questions in the chat. That we do, we've got a few of them. So one of the questions that we have received in the chat box is what remote sensing techniques did you use and were they effective given the underbrush? So we used GPR um, and we had a, a team come out and clear and just enough underbrush to, to do the GPR in the places where we thought there would be potential for buried features. So it was a challenge because you saw how densely vegetated some of those areas were, but our GPR teams are used to being thrown into the thickest stuff ever. So <laughs> they were able to, uh, they were able to get in there and get some idea of where we could target things, but truly it was, it was 50, 50 when it came to, you know, feature 14 was different because it was the thickest and none of the Crabtree family, living family remembered that residence. But there, were, there was a, a good amount of guidance that came from the family that said, I, I kind of remember it was right over here. And we had some standing elements that gave us, you know, we have the abandoned roadbed, we have an, a collapsing animal pen, you know, so it was definitely, it was still 50-50. <laughs> All right. Another question is the site was discovered during the section 106 survey. What was the ultimate recommendation recommendation and decision made in terms of NRHP eligibility? So the site was recommended eligible in, under A, B and D and uh, the, the SHPO concurred with that. And so that's why there's a plan for a data recovery at some point. And a follow up is, um, it sounds like you're saying that National Registry criteria doesn't address stories of traditionally underserved populations. Do you have any insight as if to if there's any opportunity to change that? Absolutely. I, I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, having um, archaeologists specifically and those that can work closely with historians well trained in understanding the the criteria for historic significance uh, is is critical. I mean, you mentioned Tom King, and like that's about as far as most folks get in graduate school. But getting to really know how an eligibility argument works, and where integrity and where historic significance come together, and where they, you know, I just think it's it's an often just disregarded component, you know, because they're they're broad you know, um, broad themes of history, you know, things like that, that like, you know, if you don't really look at it, um, you're just going to miss it. <laughs> I think. So, yeah, I do feel, I do feel like there's a trend and there should be a trend, um, towards educating active archeologists and upcoming archeologists and how to interpret historic significance at, at these kinds of sites. 
Excellent. So what do you think folks can do to participate and actively engage in enhancing that future opportunity? Outreach, talking, 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 just go meet the people that you're working with, you're working for. And I don't mean the client, you know, I mean, the people that are related to the resource. Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, you have to be engaged. You cannot be clinical. You cannot be cut and dry about these things. And I mean, this, this site told an amazing story and this, the, the participation of this family in a, in such an important community, you know, could have just been lost if, if chastity didn't sneak up behind me and in their cemetery at 7 a.m. barefoot <laughs> and say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that'd be a surprise that early in the morning. It certainly was. <laughs> oh, what that opened up many chapters. That's phenomenal. I love that. It's been a really special relationship that we've been able to have with this family. It sounds like it. Thanks for thanks for sharing that with everyone here tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> We've received a few more questions. Um, I've read your chapter in a recent foodway archaeology book. Was there any evidence of foodways from the site? I mean, yes. <laughs> That is so funny. Uh, I just had a, a, a memory popped up where, as we were doing the metal detector survey, I don't even think this was a metal detector find, but while we were working in Locust 3, the, the most densely, like there was so much with the beautiful walkway and stuff. Um, we were clearing vegetation and sort of pulling up these like surface level roots and found this big serving spoon. And I, I remember thinking, oh, that's fun. That just reminds me of what we'll use on Sunday to serve casserole or whatever. And Chastity told me that the house likely burned down because somebody left a pot of food cooking. <laughs> and then Clarence later was said a different story. And it was so funny because, they, it, you know, it's that family lore. And, like, there were burned glass. There was blur burned glass in and around this giant serving spoon. <laughs> and so, I mean, there wasn't any floral or faunal remains that, you know, we analyzed at that level. But um, there certainly was southern food waste. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we had another question just pop on. Um, uh, was is there a possibility that the crowd trees can get their land back and recover their land? Or what's the next step? Unfortunately, that's not for me to say. I uh, we did this uh, project for Kimley Horn and for T dot as a compliance effort, and so. Telling the story is all New South can say. So, thank you for sharing. Well, folks, we've got some more time, um, and so we'll we'll pause just a moment to see if anyone has any other lingering questions. If so, please add those to the chat box. I do see that we have a couple call-in users, so at this time, I'm just going to open up the floor for our call-in users to unmute themselves if they have any questions they would like to ask. And to unmute yourself, you just press star six to unmute, and then when you're ready to mute again after your question, star six again. Any call on users? One more moment. All righty. Again, if you've got a question, please add it to the chat box. Oh, we did get another one. What were the southern foodways? Was there any evidence of local distilling? Of local what? Distilling? Mm -hmm. No. No, I, I, uh, it, the land there is very flat and little hills. There are no crevices or areas where you'd hide a still. <laughs> I, as far as bottles go, um, I don't even believe we had, oh, wait, yeah, no, there were some bottles in the, one of the dumps in the back, but definitely not like made at home, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So what were the Southern foodways then that were, that you might've seen or discovered? 
I mean, um, in those dumps, there were some of the tin, and I'm not super great with historic artifacts, especially 20th century. So, like, um, the, like, tin painted bowls, big serving bowls and dishes and things like that. Um, just, you know, the side effects of living in the South. <laughs> but, yeah, no, nothing, nothing specific. They responded uh, family style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and that's that's the the story from the oral interview, and um, that that really uh, summarized it a little bit in there. But the way that um, Clarence and Matthew talked about the strawberry harvest when they were kids was truly. Um, it just made you smile because they talked about the traveling folks that would come in and help with the harvest, but the way that the women, they would set up a, and, you know, they would set up a giant table and just feed everyone family style every day, every evening. And the way they smiled thinking about it, you know, it wasn't a ton of detail, but it did feel like such a nostalgic memory for them. That was just beautiful. and and. Portland and their strawberries, I mean, still chef's kiss, you know. <laughs> well, sounds like I got to travel that way and get some of those strawberries. <laughs> they should. They have a strawberry festival, in fact. So we, we should All check right. on the TDOA website or something because I've heard it's a really <laughs> great event. And I'd also like to plug um, the, oh, I hope I get this right, the Portland Historical Society. That's probably not right. I should have got this beforehand, but um, Chastity has been working really hard to incorporate the findings from her farmstead into the local history museum. She's a very active member of their of their group and has helped establish a museum. She has a garden plot next door to it that she purchased, a community garden. Um, this woman is all about sustainability, heritage, legacy. So, I mean, integral to all of this. So. That's phenomenal. Oh, we had another question pop up. All right. He speak. Oh, okay. Speaking of bottles, were there any medicine or cosmetic products or anything else notable among the artifacts you found? So the, um, the image that was on the 1st slide while you were talking. Or while Phil was introducing, maybe that's a cosmetic case from the early 1920s that we found at feature 14, the house that, you know, it was hidden up in the woods that had the most spectacular metal detector finds there. I mean, um, we had, I, you know, outside of like door plates and like little bits and pieces of the house, there was a spoon handle that had been carved into a key and it had a little hole in it like it was worn or it was kept on a belt to be used just the most personal things and that slide that i showed that had the strawberries on it uh i had no idea about this before i saw this but it's called a flower frog southern people might know that i don't know it's so it's the it's the flat piece that looks like a brush and it's all metal and you would use it to stick flowers on to make a flower arrangement. Just these little pieces of of personal history that truly did. I mean, Chastity was there every day. And what did we get today? It's so it was so neat, you know. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. It's really Absolutely. a beautiful story. <laughs> All right, and um, folks, generally, if you've got any more questions after we sign off, please feel free to um, send those to us. And I'm about to paste um, Phil and my email here in the chat box, so you have that. But I think I think if we don't have any more questions, we can um, wrap up and start moving towards the conclusion of our presentation here today. And I'm going to share this last slide here. 
and that also has Phil in um, my email. And Phil, before I, I sign us off, do you have any uh, last words? Uh, just to thank Lauren, uh, Danny, and Velma for, um, for sharing this project with us. I'm looking forward to the report and and more than that, maybe seeing some alternative mitigation products and the standard archaeology report. You know, so you mentioned some outreach projects um, like the barbecue or other things. There's maybe some video products yeah. um, so that we can you can put a uh, voice, uh, put the Crabtree's voice to um, the history and archaeology of the farmstead um, to contextualize it and give us a better sense for give the public a better sense for for the Crabtree farmstead, hearing it in the, in the words of the Crabtrees themselves. So. Uh, but a great project, um, great history, great significance. Thank you for sharing it with us and we look forward to seeing more on it. So appreciate you uh, giving the presentation tonight. I will, My pleasure. you bet, uh, thank you. I will turn it back to Megan here to close us out. Ready? thank you, Bill. And thank you, Lauren, so much for sharing with us today and speaking with us. Again, for everyone who have joined, if, um, you come up with a question this evening after we sign off or tomorrow, please feel free to shoot us an email and we'll do our best to provide you a response. This meeting has been recorded, so we'll post a copy of it on the department on the divisions uh, YouTube page. So you can tune in later and review content again. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we've been hosting this series on the 3rd Thursday of the month through October. So we hope you can join us this coming September 15th for our next virtual lecture series. More information can be found on the division's current research in Tennessee archaeology website. You can find that on a quick Google search or whatever your search engine is um, just by typing and searching TDEF Division of Archaeology Research Series, and it should be the first, um, first link listed. I've also included that in the chat box for you. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or Phil using the contact email listed in the slide or in the chat box there. And I'm about to include a survey link here in the chat box. Um, it's really short, just a few questions. We would appreciate it if you would uh, go to that survey, navigate to that survey and um, provide um, a response to those questions. We really appreciate any feedback, um, any insights to help us continue to improve these virtual events. And again, thank you for everyone for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you on September 15th. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Lauren. Thanks, y'all. Good night. Good evening. <laughs>